on your uh, where your your name is or your screen is in the top right corner. There's uh, there's three little dots. If you scroll over your face, if you click on that, and then you click on where it says rename. If you wouldn't mind just putting your first name and then your pronouns. So if, if you see mine, it should just say Van and they them. Well, thank you all for doing that. So what I want you all to, to take away from this uh, workshop is understanding that gender is a construct, uh, mental health risk factors for trans, uh, non-cis, non-conforming and or non-binary folks, knowing that our differences are not um, based on our gender and or identities, how to take space and make space, how to be affirming, and how to identify and address our own internalized transphobia. So, oh, it looks like Rachel doesn't have three dots. Okay, so um, if you look at your, um, your, your picture, can you, can you all see where your faces are on, on the screen? Um, so if you go to the, if you kind of put your mouse over it to the right hand corner, you, unmute should pop up and three dots should pop up. So you click on the three dots and then down it'll say unmute, stop video, chat, and then rename. You click rename and then uh, that's, that's how you uh, rename it to just put your first name uh, and then your pronoun or pronouns. Anybody still need any additional support with that? So I want to cover a couple terms before we start. So the term cis, or some people say cisgender, is someone whose identity aligns with the gender that the person was assigned at birth. Um, sorry, it looks like it's not working for some folks. And I don't know how to do it from my end. Maybe if one of my co-hosts could help um, with that. If not, that's OK if you can't get your name and pronouns to, to pop up. Um, Okay, so sorry, back, back to the term. Um, oh, and Van, if you could please go back a few slides because I think we were still doing our names when you were going through the objectives. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, this is my first time teaching on Zoom, so I uh, thank you for being patient with me. I really appreciate it. Um, are we good to, to keep moving forward? Okay, awesome. All right, so um, I'll start from the beginning of the terms, if that's all right with all of y'all. Um, so cis or cisgender uh, is somebody who I, whose identity aligns with the gender that the person was assigned at birth. Um, ass assigned at birth is what the doctor assigned your sex um, when they were observing uh, essentially your genitals. So you come out of the womb and they look at the genitals and they see uh, a certain genital that they immediately classify as male or female. Uh, but this is not somebody's real sex, it's not somebody's real gender, it's not biology, it's not biological sex, it's not biological gender, um, it's not what somebody was before. Uh, people aren't born a boy or a girl, and we'll get into that later on. I just am throwing some examples of what people often refer to as what is assigned at birth um, versus what, it, what it's not. So some other terms are non-cis or trans, uh, which is somebody whose identity differs from the gender that they were assigned at birth. So I typically say non-cis or trans versus transgender to create more inclusivity of all folks, because not all folks' uh, identities fall within the gender spectrum. Um, there are people who are agender or no gender um, or non-binary that don't uh, fit under the umbrella of just transgender. And transgender has this um, connotation to it that you are 
one gender and now are another gender. Um, and so to create kind of more inclusivity, I tend to just say not cis or trans. Um, and also that transgender connotation has this idea of being opposite. You were one thing and now you're the opposite, which again, erases the identities for folks who are non-binary, who are non-conforming, um, and or outside or, or all of the, the gender spectrum. Um, and somebody who's non-binary does not mean that they are trans. Uh, you can be non-binary and you can be trans and you can also be non-binary and not trans. You can also be trans and not binary. Um, so, oh yeah, I said that gender non-conforming doesn't also mean trans. So I created this little, what I call my non-cis identity umbrella. And I didn't list every single identity that there is out there because there's so many identities out there, but I wanted to give uh, an idea of how many potentially identities that there might be. And I also don't go in and explain every single one because no one identity is exactly the same. It's all based on what it means to that person. So an example that might be um, more relatable to some folks is that asking somebody, you know, please define what it means to be a woman. And one person's definition of that is not gonna be the same exact definition as every single other woman. And so it's the same thing with all of these identities that are, are listed here. Um, so just because you learn what it means to be maybe um, gender non-binary, that doesn't mean that that's what it means for every single person whose identity is non-binary. If, if I'm going too fast, or if you have any questions, please uh, send them through chat because it's, it's, it's very difficult because I can't see y'all's faces to see if, if you're getting it or, or, or how it's going for y'all. So I'd like to do uh, an activity. It's, an, it's, it's to help us identify some of our internalized transphobia. Um, I do give a tr trigger warning that this activity may be triggering for some people here. And I ask that you please take care of you and you do what you need to do, whether it's uh, muting me, um, taking a step back, breathing, whatever it is you need to do. Um, what I'm going to ask of you is I'm going to pull up a Word document. Uh, it does say please shout out. Please don't shout out. Please type them into chat. I'm going to ask you to type into chat any word or messages that comes to mind when you hear non-binary, non-cis, trans, transgender. Um, it doesn't mean that just because you write that word that I, me or anybody here is going to believe that you believe that about folks but it's really important to share anything that you've maybe ever heard, uh, messages in the media. It could be things like disgusting, wrong, trendy, um, whatever it is that you heard, it doesn't have to be what we might label as positive. So the more honest that we can be and the more that we can um, share, uh, the, the better this activity is gonna work. So I'm gonna stop sharing the PowerPoint and I'm gonna switch over to the Word document. If you all could start typing in any types of words and or messages that you have heard around these identities. Oh, we have snowflake, weirdo, weirdo. Forgive me for my typing errors. Just trying to get this as quickly as I can.
you wrote one earlier and I didn't write it, please resend it. I think I got them all as they're coming in, but I'm also trying to go. I mean, they're also coming in a little fast and that's okay. I appreciate that. Oh, you can't see all the screen? Um, okay, where's unstable suicide? I'm happy, sugar, pervert. Okay, if anybody has any last ones, um, I think that we could end it about here unless there's any more that uh, that you wanna share. And then I'm gonna stop sharing this for now and we will come back to this list. Um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties on how to do this. Okay, so let me go back. Thank you all for, for participating and in, 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 uh, engaging in, um, for some folks, emotional labor, for, for other folks, like just, I appreciate you providing all those words. Um, okay, so here's something that I like people to think about is, you know, how long did you think about your gender and your, or your identity growing up? and or even now. Uh, and if you'd like to send in the chat box, please feel free to do that. Uh, I also like folks to think about how many times that you're aware of is your gender used when it's not relevant. Like, hi ladies, hey gal pals. Uh, Does anybody want to share? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, any response to either of these questions? And if not, that's okay too. Hi, I'll share. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'll respond to the first question. Um, so I'm a gender, and when I was a kid, uh, I was a gender then too but it was okay because I didn't have any body dysphoria. But then when I hit puberty, I started having a lot of problems, but I still didn't think about it as a gender issue until I grew up and realized that trans people existed. Um, so I've been thinking about it for a real long time, but I never, I didn't really have the words to, to figure out what the real problem was for a long time. Thank you for sharing. I'll share too. Thanks for sharing, Adrian. Um, uh, gender queer and non-binary. Um, when I was younger, I remember thinking about gender often when I knew it was something that I enjoyed playing with, um, both uh, for male and female and sort of whatever I was uh, mixing it into. But I think mostly what I felt affected by was when um, I was being excluded because of gender, like um, when I couldn't play with the boys um, or I was allowed to play, but it was uh, like I was treated differently and had to prove myself more um, or was told that like I, you know, uh, hit like a girl or threw like a girl or something that cast me as um, separate or different. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Would anybody else like to share? Um, I've been thinking a lot about the second question. I feel like people use gendered terms all the time and 
it's interesting as a teacher of young children to recognize that and hear that from other educators or parents um, when they could be working in ways that removed that type of language from um, our children's lives and giving them a little more space and freedom without having a lot of gender terms. Thank you for sharing. Oh, I have an interesting one to add to that, uh, Rachel, too, about um, I work with young children and um, I don't yet have children of my own, but um, oftentimes I notice um, other adults who sort of refer to like, um, will I be a mother or a father once I have children? Um, and so that's kind of an interesting space to be in. I think we have time for maybe one more person if somebody else wants to share. And thank you all for your vulnerability and willingness to, to share these painful experiences. Okay, I think that we'll move on to the next activity. I'm not sure if y'all got- One more share in oh, the there chat. Was? In the chat, Bam. Oh, okay. A couple of shares in the chat. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing those. So what I'd like y'all to do, I'm not sure if you were able to read the email that came last night asking um, for you to make a list of, oh, I guess it's not, the, a list of essentially nine things, the three things that you, where is it? So it's the three things that you do every week and or day, the three most important people that you interact with most often and things that you are working towards accomplishing. Um, will you raise your hand if you have not written these things down? Okay, cool, so everybody's done it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you all in uh, breakout rooms for three minutes. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to engage in a conversation where you're gonna wanna try to get to know the, the person that you're in the room with and really engage with them in a conversation. And you wanna ask them questions, uh, you know, what do you do every day or week? Who are the most important people in your life and what are you working towards accomplishing? And when you're responding, you cannot respond with anything that's on your list and or allude to anything that's on your list. So for example, if I had put um, my mom on there as somebody who I care about, I can't say the person married to my father or the person who I came out of their womb, like nothing that alludes to giving away. And the purpose is not to guess what the other person is trying to hide from you. It's just really trying to build that connection uh, and getting to know each other while not sharing uh, these uh, things on your list. Does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand if, if you have any questions before I, I put you all in breakout rooms. So I don't know if I can see everyone, but I don't see anyone's hand up. So I'm going to, uh, do, do a breakout room, try my best to, let's see. Uh, okay, let's see. Is there a way to tell how many people are on here? Ken or Gata? It should tell you that there are 18. 18. It oh. says manage purchase. Oh, I'm sorry, Gata, go ahead. 18, okay, a beautiful so. turnout, I might add. Thank you all. I'm going to, I appreciate y'all uh, being patient with me. Let's see. Let's see. One, two. Ken, are you okay sitting this one out? Because there is a odd number of people. Absolutely. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, I'm opening the rooms now. So there should be like a pop-up on your screen to join the room, awesome.
looks like Lori and Rachel uh, need to join a room. A pop-up should come up. If Lori doesn't, then I might add you to the room that Lori's in, Ken, if that's okay with you. Okay, I where that was. That's breakout room six. Oh man, I can't. I guess I'll just go join it with Jessica and do the activity. And then in a couple minutes, I'll come back. Let me figure out how to pull my chat box up again. So if if anybody would like to share verbally or um, or or write out, um, what was that like for you? What came up and why do you think we did this activity? Um, I'll share my experience um, with my partner. It was um, very, I enjoy the conversations. However, it was also, there was a delay of what was between what you were thinking versus what was coming out of your mouth. So you had to be very mindful um, and deliberate of what, or deliberate and being intentional of what you're trying to say without saying what you're allowed to say, if that makes sense. Um, so that kind of is my answer to all the questions in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, I'm seeing that it was difficult. I'm, I'm reading that it was easy. Um, so would anybody else like to share their experience or why would they think we did this before I answer it? Um, I really liked that it forced me to think of <laughs> something else. Um, so that way, I think there was more of a um, connection because you were trying to think about it so much. Thank you. Any any last person want to take a guess or share their experience? I actually got paired with someone that I know really well, and so oh. we kind of talked about the pro the the idea, the activity, um, rather than get to know each other because we already knew those things, which I think is in itself telling that if you are having a conversation with someone you know, there's not as much like, worry or stress about those things that you're not supposed to talk about. Thank you all for sharing and thank you for participating in this activity and sorry for pairing you with somebody you knew if I, if I did that. Um, 
So the intentionality of this activity is to cultivate empathy, especially for folks who may not have had to experience what it's like to have to hide part or parts or all of your identities. Um, so that's why, like, and it's, it's having to hold all these different parts because you want to be really connecting and get to know this person while holding all the parts in your head of what you can't mention while not allowing somebody to be able to get in fully because these are the parts that you're hiding, which is similar to somebody, uh, but it's more 24 seven who's having to hide whether they're trans or gay or queer or whatever part that they're having to hide. So for example, if somebody asked me what I did, I spend a lot of my time doing advocacy and, uh, and work with the, the non-cis population, right? But if that's a part of my identity that I'm trying to hide because it's not safe for me to share it, I'm gonna have to quickly jump on my toes um i teach oh what do you teach you know classes like having to constantly be holding all those things while also trying to listen and connect with the person across from you is uh is there is there any questions um about the activity So um, I'm, I want to cover a couple more terms. Uh, so uh, one of the terms is uh, transphobia, and that's a hate, fear, or not believing or mistrust of people whose identities do not match the gender that was assigned at birth and or whose identity expression uh, does not conform to societal uh, gender and or expression roles. So the term internalized transphobia, this is the feeling that we all have inside that we're not aware of. It's a common attitude that we learn in our culture, in our society. So before I look at those examples, that's where we'll loop into the activity that we initially did earlier with all of these different words. Whether we believe them um, or not, we've heard them and they're inside us uh, in our subconscious. And so this all contributes to our, our internalized transphobias in the way that, that we engage uh, in the world, whether we um, believe it or not, the, the, thing, the, the thing that sh can help shift this is admitting it and being aware of, of it when it shows up. So some examples that I have put on here um, is, you know, the, an internalized uh, transphobia would be girls have vaginas and boys have penises. So can y'all think of any examples, uh, if you want to type it into chat? Or, or say it out loud of some internalized transphobia that we may all hold. Like there are only two genders, that's our internalized transphobia. Um, there are no variation in genitalia, strictly penis or vagina. Um, is there any variation? It's a defect. So seeing as lesser than or problematic or something wrong. Um, trans people have to completely transition or they're not really trans. And we'll get into that later on uh, go back to that slide please the one with all the words uh give me one second this is all new to me okay so i am on that slide the new baby sex reveal is a traditional big deal yeah I would have never guessed you were trans. Yeah, that's, that's, and we'll, we'll talk about microaggressions, but those are all rooted in our internalized transphobia. If I, if I just X this out, can you see the PowerPoint still? Okay. Thumbs up if you could see the PowerPoint. You see the PowerPoint? Okay. All right. So, oh, I'm going to, to move on, feel free to keep adding stuff in the in the group chat. Oh, you, you can't see the PowerPoint. Van, we're not seeing the PowerPoint. I found with uh, Zoom, you need to stop share and then reshare to the PowerPoint again when you've got a Word doc. There you go. 
Okay, thank you. Oh, let me check. Oh. My thing froze and I can't really see the chat. Well, oh, okay, now I see it. I'm so sorry. Okay, so um, macroaggressions, this can be verbal and or nonverbal. It communicates a negative message and or behavior that is intentional. So something like, ew, I would never date a trans person or all trans people are the F word. It's also things like pushing out non-cis folks from spaces uh, because they are being too sensitive or too dramatic and or other reasons. Um, are there any that y'all can think of? being aggressively gendered, like they choose either he and sir or she and ma'am, and they intentionally and emphatically put those labels on you without your consent and being stared at. Yeah, so I think that that can be two ways. I think it could start as a microaggression when you walk into a place and they sir, ma'am, miss, misses you. Um, and then when you correct them and then they still don't um, respect that, that's when I think it shifts into that macroaggression because there's one of them engaging in their internalized transphobia with a microaggression without being aware of it, uh, which is which is the next slide of um, a microaggression, which is this can be verbal and or nonverbal and communicates a negative message, which is sometimes unintentional. It doesn't mean it's okay just because it's not known, but when somebody's intentionally misgendering you and using the wrong pronouns uh, or prefixes, then that's when it becomes a macroaggression. Um, so somebody wrote, we don't have a single stall restroom, just pick one. Yes, uh, having to choose between a limited choice of gender on forms, male or female only, yes. So an example of a microaggression would be, you're so beautiful for a trans girl, or how somebody earlier said, I, I, couldn't, have, I couldn't tell that you were trans. Um, or again, like walking into a place or when you answer the phone and immediately it's Mr. Miss, Mrs. only having those two options. Uh, limited labels of clothing, male or female, boys or girls. So let's talk about uh, gender being a societal construct. So what I mean is that gender is literally constructed in the culture that, that, we're li that we grew up in. Um, and so an example of that, if we were to see somebody that we might be quick to judge and label as male wearing a skirt, somebody might quickly say, oh, there's a man wearing women's clothing versus in Scotland, uh, the same situation, the label would be, oh, there's a man wearing a kilt. Um, and so just depending on what area you grew up in, the, 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 the culture at large, as well as down to your family um, and your religious institutions, all the different messages that you receive. And so what it looks like outside of those constructs uh, are folks who are non-binary, who are fluid, who are genderqueer, anything that might be underneath that trans umbrella or non-cis umbrella, um, or even beyond that. Um, and the impact of falling outside of those constructs is being pathologized. And what pathologized means for folks you might not know is, is being labeled with like a mental illness um, or something wrong with you. Uh, Falling outside those constructs, can people experience violence and danger? Are there any that y'all can think of, of what happens when you don't fall into our societal constructs of male and female masculinity, femininity? Limited choice for where you work or what your employment is, exclusion, discrimination. Not being safe in public spaces.
potentially limited risks to access to housing, um, all or none thinking. Losing family and friends. Losing support. Self-isolation. One that came up this year was with the census. It's either pick male or female or not be counted. Um, being ostracized from the queer community, having difficulty having medical care, self-exclusion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on with the slide, but please feel free to continue to add stuff to the chat. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. So some more terms are primary sex characteristics. These are the body structures that directly relate to reproduction. So like the testes and the ovaries, which are also known as gonads. Secondary sex characteristics are the parts of us that society has dictated as masculine, feminine, and or othered. So that goes back to those societal constructs. Um, it could be facial hair, it could be breasts. Um, and so I don't know why I put this slide here, but if you have any questions, please put them in the, in the group chat. Um, so what defines gender? Is it our anatomy? Is it our secondary and primary sex characteristics? Is our gender uh, defined by having a penis or a vagina, testicles, ovaries, breasts, facial hair? Um, the one thing that I really liked, I, I did find that there were some microaggressions in there, but as a, I think that the message that came across uh, was pretty um, impactful. Uh, was by Rebecca R. Helm. Um, it's a bunch of tweets, and I'm just going to go through them, but I, I, I really liked how she explained things. And if, if you know a bit about biology, you'll probably say that biological sex is caused by chromosomes XX, and you're female, and XY, you're male. This is a chromosomal sex, but it is, is it biological? Well, it turns out there is only one gene on the Y chromosome that really matters to sex. It's called the SRY gene. During human embryonic development, the SRY protein turns on male-associated genes. Having an SRY gene makes you genetically male, but is this biological sex? Sometimes that SRY gene pops off the Y chromosome and over to an X chromosome. Surprise, so now you've got an X with an SRY and a Y without an SRY. What does this mean? A Y with no SRY, SRY means physically you're female, chromosomally you're male, XY, and genetically you're female, so no SRY. An X with an SRY means you're physically male, chromosomally female, XX, and genetically male. But biologically, sex is simple. There must be another answer. Sex-related genes ultimately turn on hormones in specific areas on the body, and reception of those hormones by cells throughout the body is this the root of biological sex. Hormonal male means produce normal levels, uh, and I, I do like how she puts it in quotes, um, levels of male-associated hormones, except some percentage of females will have higher levels of male hormones than some percentages of males. So ditto to female hormones. So if you're developing your body, you may not produce enough hormones for your genetic sex, leading you to be genetically male or female, chromosomally male or female, hormonally non-binary, and physically non-binary. Well, except cells have something to say about this. Maybe cells are the answer to biological sex, right? Well, cells have receptors that hear the signal from sex hormones, but sometimes those receptors don't work, like a mobile phone that's on do not disturb, call and cell and they do not answer. So it means you may be genetically male or female, chromosomally male or female, hormonally male, female, non-binary, with cells that may or may not hear the male, female, non-binary call, and this is all leading to a body that can be male, non-binary, or female. So try out some combinations for yourself and notice how confusing it gets. Can you point to what the absolute cause of biological sex is? Is it fair to judge people by it? Of course, you could try appealing to the numbers. Most people are either male or female, you say, except that as a biologist professor, I will tell you, the reason I don't have my students look at their own chromosomes in class is because people could learn that their chromosomal sex does not match their physical sex, and learning that in the middle of a 10-point assignment is just not the time. So even though that whole uh, tweet, or at least for me, still gets very, very confusing, um, I do like that it shows that it's not just this um, black and white, male, female, um, based on our societal constructs of genitalia, hormones, chromosomes, all of those things, that it's a lot more complicated. Uh, oh, 
sorry, I didn't finish reading. Uh, biological sex is complicated. Before you discriminate against someone on the basis of biological sex and identity, ask yourself, have you seen your chromosomes? Do you know the genes of the people you love, the hormones of the people you work with, the state of their cells? Since the answer will obviously be no, please be kind, respect people's rights to tell you who they are, and a reminder that you don't have all the answers. Again, biology is complicated. Kindness and respect don't have to be. I thought, I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so oftentimes when people are talking about folks uh, who are trans, they often use terms like transition. Um, I don't like that term because I think I, it's rooted in, uh, in transphobia in the sense that like, there's this idea that you were, are one thing and now you're becoming something else versus you've always been the same person that you are. And it also has this kind of medical model idea that you have to engage in certain things, take hormones, surgeries, in order to be who you are. And again, that goes back to the societal constructs that men have beards, women uh, have breasts and vagina. Um, versus like we are who we are they, we don't have to engage in those societal constructs that we've internalized uh, as what makes us who we are and so I, I i use different terminology for what oftentimes people might call social transition i call it a social shift oh another thing around transition too is that if somebody were to have a nose job or get breast implants we don't say that they transitioned we just say they had it they had a rhinoplasty or they had, had a nose job yet with a trans person if they have any type of surgery to, to, have, to be more affirming, which is again, the same thing that somebody might have um, a rhinoplasty because they want a more affirming face. They want a nose that affirms what they have uh, believed to be beauty. And, and it's the same thing for, for trans folks. Um, we're, sorry. Um, so a social shift might be using a different name or names and or pronouns. Uh, it's a physical presentation that may differ than the societal construct that was imposed on us. Uh, we may, folks may use restrooms that, that matches the person's identity. Uh, and there may even be changes in social roles. So if your living situation uh, was for one gender that is not your identity, you may be moving. Same with colleges you're attending. There may be gender specific schools uh, that don't match your identity and uh, somebody may have gone there because they were not safe enough to be who they were and then once they uh, came into their own felt that they no longer feel like this is a the, the place that is right for them because um, we're all at different phases in our learning and our journey about ourselves and a lot of those factors are those external factors too of is it safe for me to be myself um, another thing people often talk about is medical transition, and I just call it medical. It's anything having to do with medical doctors. It could be medications, uh, taking hormones, and I think it's really important for people to know that not all people use hormone therapy. Um, and same thing with surgeries. Not all people have dysphoria, which is the dissatisfaction with their body. Um, that dissatisfaction with the body is often rooted in our internalized transphobia of what it what certain genders or non-genders look like, which then we believe in order for us to be this, we have to look this way. And so I, I ask you all to hold that not all trans people want and or need surgery or hormones. Any questions so far? Sorry, I haven't looked at the chat. Let me peek over. Okay. So gender and mental health. 50.8% uh, of trans men 41.8% of non-binary people and 29.9% of trans women and 27.9% of folks questioning their identity attempt suicide in comparison to cis men and cis women, which is 9.8 to 17.6%. And again, these numbers I think are significantly lower than what the reality is. I have yet to meet a trans person who hasn't thought about dying by suicide and or attempting to die by suicide. So some things that can contribute to mental health issues that non-cis people face is discrimination, stigma, lack of acceptance, rejection, and abuse. This then triggers a stress response due to the anticipation of this occurring, which can increase anxiety, depression, hopelessness, helplessness, and vigilance. What else do you know of that the stress response can trigger? So if anyone who's just joined us now, I, I've just been asking people to, to type stuff in the chat group box.
stress-related illness. Sometimes people go back in the closet after having been, been out, so not being able to live one's authentic life, which would then impacts the self-esteem. Self-doubt, running away, so potentially housing stability. Self-isolation. Feel free to keep adding to it. I'm, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Oh, let's see, leaving community and religion. So, so again, like losing that support, even if it might not have been supported, it was still a group that, that you were a part of, um, physical illness. So growing up, we received messages from our family, from our friends, society, religion, and much more. Uh, the messages that are received can directly impact our self-esteem. So what are some messages that you received about any and or all of your identities? And they don't have to just be around gender, but I think that it would be helpful even if, if you're cis, if you're trans, if you're non-binary, any identity um, around gender, I think that we all receive uh, some kind of messages as well as how did it feel? Um, some examples would be having children, how one engages in sex, um, if, if y'all felt comfortable or wanted to share in message, or if you wanted to, to share, you could unmute yourself. Somebody wrote, why are you not married yet? Why don't you have kids? I must take responsibility for the entire collective as a person of African descent. Who's the man? It was burdensome and stressful. Before I was 10, my friend's mom, my friend's mom told me I, I was getting a belly on me. She never said anything like this to my friends who were boys. Boys don't cry, take charge in the bedroom. As a woman, uh, idea it. It's a job to take care of everyone. As a woman, it's a waste for me to be a lesbian. Even when, when reading these, uh, we may feel like we don't, or even know that like we don't believe these to be true and they're so deeply rooted in us because they were communicated to us by the people that we trusted or that we may still trust. Uh, you don't fit the standard of beauty. If you don't lose weight, you'll never find happiness. A uh, woman can't do certain physical activities, uh, need to be emotionally sensitive to others. Again, thank you for sharing these, uh, uh, these with everybody. If you want a relationship, you have to be less picky. Feel free to keep adding stuff. I'm going to move on. Uh, I work with children, and I constantly hear teachers say to female children, you look so beautiful, you're dressed so sparkly, but say nothing to the male children. Uh, you'll change your mind one day. So uh, a trans, non-cis, non-binary, non-conforming person growing up in an environment that's not supportive of their identity can create a strong self-hatred, which then impacts their self-esteem. Currently in our society, it's communicated that like, uh, Folks who are trans or non-binary aren't even able to use the restroom, right? Like how many places really have a restroom that just says toilet or restroom? Even, even the ones that say gender neutral is still uh, excluding folks whose identity does not fall within the gender spectrum. Um, but even, even like a gender neutral restroom isn't really often available. So how can we... How can we support one another is accepting that we're all different and trusting that we know what is best for ourselves. We are the expert of our own experiences. So how you can do that is creating space for everyone despite if you agree with what you might label as someone's choice, lifestyle, and or other invalidating language is what can significantly impact our individual experience. So someone's identity is not a difference of opinion. You don't get to disagree 
you don't get to agree to disagree that this is somebody's identity. Like that's not a place that anybody gets a, an opinion of. So when you meet yourself, uh, not meet yourself, <laughs> when you meet somebody, uh, it can be, it's really important to introduce yourself with your pronouns. Um, the reason that I say your pronouns and not preferred gender pronouns is anytime we use the word preferred, it's saying it's invalidating to the person because it's, it's saying this is not who you are, this is who you prefer to be, right? Including preferred name, right? You just say like, what is your name? Uh, and then I don't say gendered pronouns because again, there are many folks who do not identify, whose identity doesn't fall within the gender spectrum. So just removing both those words, you still communicate the same message, pronouns, uh, and it creates more inclusivity to all folks. So if you're wondering uh, what the person's gender is, ask yourself, why do I need to know that? What am I really trying to find out? Does this relate to society's obsessions with genitals? Because it all comes down to what's between your legs, because what's between your legs is what uh, the doctor dictated, defined whether you were male or female. Um, and so if what you're trying to find out is what someone's pronouns are, then, then that's more the question versus what is somebody's gender, because somebody's gender doesn't always align with our societal constructs of pronouns. So somebody, uh, somebody's identity might be male and they might still use they, them pronouns, or somebody's identity might be non-binary and they may use she, her, he, him, and they, them pronouns, uh, or any, essentially our gender does not necessarily mean that it's going to align with the pronouns that our societal constructs have, or that we've internalized as matching with. So somebody said, what is a good way to ask a person's pronouns? So first I always say, introduce yourself with the pronouns. If somebody doesn't share their pronouns, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask because there might be a reason that they're not sharing. They may not feel safe enough. Um, it, because if it's somebody who doesn't know what that means, what your pronouns are, they're going to ask, what do you mean pronouns? Uh, and then that's going to be an indicator that maybe some, some education around that will happen. But if somebody hears you share their pronouns and they, all, they don't share theirs, it might also mean that it's not safe. Um, somebody put, how do you want me to refer to you? Uh, I, th I think that maybe a, a different way would just be, you know, what are your pronouns? Because that makes it more like this is, is, is real. Um, this is who you are. Um, refer can sometimes have this connotation of that might not be who you really are and I might not really agree with it, but I'm going to uh, be um, respectful to respect whatever you tell me versus what are your pronouns. Because um, even like saying what pronouns do you use can also uh, potentially feel invalidating because it's like, well, I'm telling you the pronouns I use, but again, that doesn't mean that you believe me that this is my identity. Are there any other questions around this? It looks like Sarah was the one who asked if there's a good way. Sometimes people default to they, them. So I think that somebody wrote that sometimes people default to they, them. Um, and I do see that. The reason that I, I would veer away from that is because that'd be like everybody defaulting to he, him, or she, hers. It erases all the other identities. And so if you don't know someone's pronouns, but you know their name, use their name. If you don't know their name, uh, and there's, you could use a descriptor, like the presenter today with the green and blue shirt. I think that's what color this is. Um, sorry, I'm trying to catch up with everything you write. I agree, but it's a bit of a relief when it happens. So I think that it's a relief when people use they, them pronouns for folks who use they, them pronouns, because then it shows like inclusivity of our identity. But again, like it erases other folks' identities who might be Zizir, she, hers, uh, who don't identify, uh, whose identity or whose pronouns are not they, them. Does that make sense? So being an ally and affirming, you need to listen, trust, and validate non-cis folks and their experience, especially people of color non-cis folks, especially black non-cis folks' experiences when they trust you enough to share their experience. Trust the person trusting you enough to share their experience, even if you do not understand or feel like you do not believe them. Their reality is the reality that they live and experience day in and day out. Yours does not matter because you do not live their life. So oftentimes when folks share what they went through or what somebody said or how they felt, it's always, you're, you're being too sensitive. Are you sure that happened? Did that really happen? I didn't see it that way. Well, oftentimes we don't 
we don't experience things the same way others because of the privilege that we hold. Um, so it's really, really important to trust the person trusting you enough to share their experience with you. So telling someone you're safe is most likely not going to shift their unsafe feeling. That's like telling somebody who's angry to calm down. Okay, you said that, but that doesn't do anything to how I feel. Um, safety is not linear and it's normal for it to shift in all directions. So just because a person trusts you with one thing, that doesn't mean that they will trust you all the time. So that's, that's really important to hold. Um, and it could, it could mean that you're not creating a safe space. It could also mean that it's hard for this person to trust because of their past experiences. And there's, there's no real way to know it. It's just more just accept that this is, this is how it is uh, for the time being. So it can be difficult to understand a person's experience due to our own privilege. So privilege is a way in which we experience the world uh, due to certain advantages outside of our control that other people, groups, populations don't have access to. So it'd be, I, I'd appreciate it if y'all could type in the chat box in what ways do you hold privilege? So for me, I'm white passing. I hold white passing privilege. Uh, Somebody wrote right, white privilege, uh, hetero passing privilege, cis passing, white, white privilege, uh, gained some male privilege when I grew a beard. Okay, uh, may not have, may not have best language for this, but able-bodied privilege, uh, economically privileged, stable home finances, white privilege. Quote unquote, high functioning. Okay, I'm gonna continue with the slides, but as more pop up, I'll, I'll read them out. So it's important that we engage in, in true empathy. Um, white privilege, white middle-aged women privilege. Uh, and I don't know how often people stop to, to think about what true empathy is to you, um, but what I know that true empathy is to me is that it's often depicted as putting yourself in the other person's experience. But when we do that, we're operating from our own lens based on our own history and our own past. So we're doing, what we think they should have done based on our own experience. Whereas to me, true empathy is putting yourself in that person's experience and really trying to understand what they have, what they've done or what they would do based on their history, their experiences, the lens that they live day in and day out. And the only way you can really get there, and you'll never be there 100%, is really trusting and getting to know the person. Because what we would have done doesn't matter because we didn't live their life. And I think it's really important to hold that um, when people are sharing with you or, or asking, you know, what should I do? So don't assume someone's experience or experiences based on what you've learned, experienced, read, or taken a course on, right? So if you take this course, that doesn't mean now you know everything about trans folks or non-binary folks, um, or even yourself, if you're trans, non-binary, or not cis, that doesn't mean that you know everything for, for everyone else. Um, who shares a similar identity. So trust the person trusting you to share or not share with you their experiences and always keep your ego in check. This is a continuous thing uh, to do is keeping uh, checking in on it. So what that means is that if you find yourself questioning the other person's experience and or doubting it, ask yourself if you are becoming defensive and ask yourself if you're engaging in true empathy, right? Like, is it is it me that's showing up because there's something that bothered me and I am forgetting about the other person. So some people added some more privilege stuff. Uh, there's career choice privilege, reaffirmed of unconditional love from parents, community privilege, colored eyes privilege. Um, seeing now during COVID, especially in my community. Thank you for sharing those. So how do we not do this? Uh, the person's experience is more valid than our own interpretation of their experience. Uh, our, our reality is not a copy and paste, even within groups and populations, and it may never become viable to understand due to the privilege we hold. 
So again, not all cis women are the same. Not all survivors of sexual violence are the same. There may be a commonality in one's identity, and this does not mean that all the people with the commonality think, act, and or behave in the same way. So what you can do is you can educate yourself. It can be easy to want to lean on the person to educate us about their community. Why is this problematic? that just through speaking. Was somebody trying to talk? I couldn't. Yeah, hear. yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. So uh, I just wanted to answer the question. Um, it's problematic because like you were saying, one person can't know all the experiences of the entire community. Um, so if you lean too much on one person, you're going to get a real biased view, no matter who it is. And also, uh, you know, if you have a lot of people leaning on you, then you're going to get real tired of educating them. Yeah, it's a lot of emotional labor. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to share why it's problematic? Oh, somebody wrote me, you're having to constantly educate, represent all uh, non-binary folks. So it's, it's not another person's responsibility to educate you on everything, only what is pertinent to their experience and what they choose to share, right? So I won't educate you on what it means for everyone to be non-binary, but I could share with you my personal experience of being a non-binary person. Um, oh, somebody wrote in the chat, no thoughts about intersectionality, only one perspective. Yeah. Um, so it's important to go to trainings, read articles, books, research blogs, et cetera, by the people who are part of the community and or population that you're learning about. Um, oftentimes it's cis folks providing trainings or writing articles uh, or pathologizing uh, non-cis folks. Um, and I'm not saying that it's all not potentially relevant and how much can somebody really know about one's experience if they're not experiencing it themselves. And it's important to support uh, well, I believe it's important to support my community. <laughs> so be cautious in getting trapped and sharing how much you know to somebody. You don't want the person to feel like an assignment that you've done all your homework on. I'm sure many of you might be able to relate uh, to one part of your identity when you've shared it that might not be, that people might not have a lot of knowledge on. And then the next thing you know, they tell you every book and every person that they've ever met um, around that, that identity that you shared or how much they know. <laughs> So the more knowledge you share with somebody about what you've learned about their community, the more you're showing your privilege. Another person's experience is what is most important, not what you know and or want to show them that you know. So how do we avoid hurting and or offending somebody? The first step is accept that you will hurt and offend despite your best intentions. Um, and now it's your job to repair. Apologize and change your behavior but don't justify your actions or create a space where the person needs to take care of you. So for example, uh, I'm gonna use, uh, let's say, uh, if, if I said she and the person's pronouns were they, and then I go, I'm so sorry, this is all new to me. You look like, a, like, I, like because you have long hair, like I'm just so used to saying she when I see long hair or whatever it is. Now it puts the burden on the other person to take care of you and be like, it's okay, it's fine. Instead, just shift it. Like, you say she, I mean they, or she, sorry, they. And if the person uh, is, corrects you and says they, don't say sorry, thank them. Thank you, thank you for correcting me. Does anybody have any questions around, you know, how to avoid hurting and or offending somebody uh, when you misgender or engage in anything? Not anything, sorry, I got distracted because somebody popped on here. Uh, some, the, the new person who popped on here, if you wouldn't mind muting your, uh, Video, please. Are there, oh, sorry, are there any questions on how to avoid hurting and or offending somebody? And feel free to you unmute and ask the question as well. Okay. So terms to avoid. 
transgendered, tranny, transgenders, a transgenderer, transsexual, shemale, he, she, um, shemale, he, uh, whatever. So instead, ask the person about their identity and respect that. Use the language they use. Someone who's transgender, a transgender, uh, transgender people, trans man, trans woman, trans non-binary, non-cis, gender non-conforming. Uh, and when I say ask the person their identity and respect that, use the language they use, even if it's on the avoid list, because there are some folks who identify as transsexual or shemale or kishi or tranny, if that's their identity, then please respect that and use that language and know that it's not a copy paste. It's not just because this person said it was okay that now it becomes applicable that you can use it for anybody who shares a similar identity. So avoid sex change, preoperative, preop, postoperative, postop, sex reassignment surgery, and just call it affirmation surgery or surgery or whatever the surgery name might be. Um, avoid biologically male, female, genetically male, female, born a man, born a woman, assigned sex at birth, was a man, was a woman. Instead, assigned male at birth, assigned female at birth, assigned intersex at birth, or assigned gender at birth. So I'm gonna read off a list of some transphobic questions. If at any point you are uncertain as to why it's transphobic, please let me know because maybe other people um, might have the same question. Sorry, I'm now seeing that there were some questions on the last slide. So I'm gonna go back, I'm sorry about that. Let's see. So make a point that you're only speaking from your experience. Can you please explain why you wrote trans man instead of trans man and trans woman instead of trans woman? I think that it's all, oh wait, that's probably two more back. I think it, I, I wrote it that way just because, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. If, if there's a reason that it would be any differently, please, uh, if you feel comfortable and want to share it with me, I, I would love to, I would love to know. Um, I'm just so used to having trans separate from everything, but that doesn't mean that it's the right way. Uh, and I appreciate you, you bringing that to my attention. Thank you. Um, hi. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering because uh, I, the way you wrote it here I've seen is, is the correct way because trans is like saying um, it's, it's not, it's not a special type of man or woman. It's uh an adjective, I think is the word I want. So like if you're saying you're a tall man, it would be the same as saying you're a trans man or whatever uh, modifier you have for man or woman. Trans is just another modifier. And that's why they would be separate, I, I think. Yeah, I, um, so I thought it was intentional on your part. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it was. Um, but no, I, I appreciate you bringing that to my, my attention. So thank you. And if I engage in any kind of microaggression, macroaggression, anything, I, I uh, encourage folks to, to bring it to my attention in, in any way that they feel safe and comfortable because I am always trying to learn. Again, like we all have internalized transphobia. Nobody's immune to it, just like we have internalized racism, ableism, all these different things. Um, and the only way to, to, to know, I mean, the only way to, to have it shift is to have it be in your awareness. Okay, so the transphobic questions. Um, what was your name before? How old were you when you knew? Why are you trans? Why did you change? Have you, when are you really going to transition? Why did you transition? Are you trying to be a real woman, man? Uh, did you have all the surgeries? What surgeries have you had? Have you have or are you going to transition? And then how do you have sex? You have both parts, a vagina and penis still. So do you like date gay people? Can I see it? Why can't you be okay with just being a man, woman, and what are you? Are there any questions around why any of these uh, are transphobic? Okay, if anything comes up for anyone, please let me know. 
So outing and coming out forever. Outing a person means sharing their identity or identities with others without their consent. Outing a person is risky and or it can be deadly. So there's this idea that somebody just comes out at one point in their life and then it's done. Like, oh, I have come out. But out, coming out is a constant process. If the person changes doctors, makes new friends, has new family members, sexual partners, and or more. Um, if you get a new job, they often ask for a birth certificate or a passport or an ID or your social security card. Or they'll ask you in background checks, have you ever used any previous names? Um, or if they ask you for your transcripts and you had a different name on your transcript. Um, anytime a previous, yeah, legal name uh, is required. It, previous and or if it's currently your legally assigned name, um, it, it forces you to have to come out. And so the reported hate crimes, which are always underreported, uh, and there are many states with laws that prevent hate crimes from actually being called hate crimes. Um, the sexual assault is one in two trans people experience sexual violence uh, in their lives, which that Again, like I, I, I think that that is much lower than the reality. Um, and so uh, I think that, I'm sorry, I got a little lost for a second. So I do want, on the next slide, I do want to take a moment of silence for the trans folks who've been murdered in the US or at least the ones that have been reported. This doesn't mean that this is all of them. Um, and I also include their age because uh, I think that it's important to know, and again, like it's varied on where I've read it, but off, it's, it, it ranged between the average age of a trans person, uh, the lifespan of a trans person is 23 years, uh, at most I've seen 32 years, which is significant, it's, it's pretty, that's super low. Um, so in 2020, uh, Dustin Parker, 25, Alexa, Nuelisa, Luciano Ruiz, uh, they didn't have this person's name, Yambi Mendes Arocho, 19, Monica Diamond, 34, and Lexi, 33, and Johanna Metz Metzger, which there was no age. So the, the importance of this training is to help us all cultivate our own awareness of our own internalized transphobias because we never know what fuel, what, what fire we're fueling with the people we talk to and the people we engage in, which not, obviously not everyone in our life, but we never know who are those people that are going to have so much internalized transphobia that they act out on these macroaggressions, which take the lives of, of my community members. And so it's, to me, it's super important that we do our best to um, unpack our own internalized transphobia and help educate and others uh, learn to identify their own internalized transphobia. Also knowing that your safety is vital. And so if it's, it's a situation where it's not safe for you to say something, then please take care of you um, because there's not much good that, that can be done if, if, we're, if we're not safe. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically the end. Um, do, are there any questions that anybody has around the workshop or anything um, related to non-cis identities? I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. I was wondering about the, um, I think there were tweets that you were sharing uh, from 
sorry, I forget the person's name uh, about like chromosomes and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that the person, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't use the word intersex, um, yeah. which I found a little odd. Uh, can you speak to that at all or anything you know about like being intersex? Um, I'd be interested in that. So um, I'm not sure if you had heard prior to me starting to read the tweet, I, def um, I did mention that there was a lot of uh, internalized transphobia, like microaggressions uh, that this person did engage in, um, in erasures of identities. I can't speak much to uh, around folks who are intersex. Um, I also am unfamiliar with folks who are intersex. Uh, my understanding is folks who are intersex don't automatically default to non-cis identities. You can be intersex and trans and or non-binary, um, but it's not because you're intersex that now you are a non-cis person. I'm not sure if that's the question you were asking or if, if not, if you could maybe um, help me try to understand more of, of what you were asking. I I missed that part before you read the tweet, so that, that helps. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you for asking the question. I appreciate it. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, well, are there, I don't want to. I don't want to say that because then that just cuts it off. Are there other questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if anything, I would like um, a tip on how to, because I'm a. I work with early, um, with young children. They are four years old, and we have a communal bathroom. They all go to the same bathroom, and they are well aware of their body parts. And they see each other. And what I run into is girls have vaginas and boys have penises. And I, because of, you know, their age, and I want to always be, I don't want to give them my ideas, but I do want them to elaborate a little bit more. Um, I don't, I say, well, they do, but that is not, I, I don't know the words that I can, that I can say to get them to it's not always like that you know boys are not boys don't always have penises girls don't always have vaginas is there <clears throat> and i heard that there's other teachers in the in the webinar right now so i just would like to know if is there other words <laughs> is there another approach i can tell them without um i, th I think like even if you think about when children would say boys have short hair and girls have long hair you could say some boys have short hair and another some, <laughs> same thing some boys have penises mm -hmm. some girls have vaginas okay that's another a very i mean and also with the shoes right like with the light up shoes and there's there's always i always get stuck and i have to I'm like well they could like them because of the lights they you can be a princess if you want to it doesn't matter if you, uh so i just so some boys, you're suggest you're suggesting some boys, some boys have. Wait, what's the word that you said? Or like, if if he's if 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 the child says, you know, boys have penises and girls have vaginas, you could say, you know, like yes, some boys have penises and some girls have vaginas, and okay. like, because it's 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 creating more room, but potentially not having to risk your livelihood as a as a teacher if if there's going to be repercussions. Um, cause I don't, I don't know where you work or how the parents are going to respond. And I don't want to tell you to say something that could jeopardize your livelihood. Yes. Thank you. No problem. I see some things coming in chat, so I'm going to try to read them. Sorry. Uh, anyone have other questions?
Well, I, I really appreciate you all coming and, and showing up and participating and being vulnerable and engaging in emotional labor. Oh, are you pointing to something, Alex? Uh, I've heard people ask what the child thinks to just so they start to question it and you're not saying your opinion. What do you suggest when you get tired of educating? What do you suggest? Like, as in like, if I'm tired, what do I suggest to do? I think that it comes down to self-care uh, and that's something that I also struggle with balancing because it's like I feel like if I'm not educating this person who's engaging in something then they're going to continue to do it and at what cost at what point do I stop when I when they're not going to hear it when they're not willing to uh, engage in true empathy um, and so whatever that might be for you for me I try to sleep enough I try to eat enough I try to drink enough water and I try to exercise those are my like basics to keep me functioning doesn't mean that I'm very good at all those things. Um, talking with a really close friend of mine or engaging in something that makes me feel nourished uh, or, you know, if, if, if you know much about like love languages, like filling your love tank, like whatever it is that would keep you going with anything else stressful. Um, just when you get tired of educating. If you're tired, it's like, if you're tired, you go take a nap, you go take a rest, you go to sleep. So if you're tired of educating the equivalent to that, what is your nap? What is your sleep? I don't know if that's the right answer, but when I actually engage in those things, I find that that is what helps me. Unfortunately, I'm someone who self-isolates. Um, to not be misgendered. Yeah, that's real. And even in that self-isolation, if your phone rings and it's a telemarketer or a doctor, or you go online or you turn on the radio or you turn on the TV, um, there's still that risk of either erasure of your, your, your gender and or being misgendered. Um, I think what has really helped me with that was finding affirming folks. And I know that that's a privilege that, that I have, that I was able to, to find people who are affirming of my identity and respectful and not just tolerate it, um, but having, for a while it was just one person and having that one person was what kept me going. And so I'm not sure if there's a way or a space, whether it's online or someone who's physically in your life that you can maybe engage in with a little bit more who's affirming of your identity, if, if that, what could be helpful. Thank you. I'm also I'm also like um, a therapist as well. So if anybody um, w was seeking any kind of like additional like support, here is my contact information that's on there. Does anyone else have uh, some more questions? Van, we're not seeing your PowerPoint anymore to see your contact info. Oh, <laughs> you're just supposed to know that it's this. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, again, I really appreciate everybody coming and being vulnerable and engaging in emotional labor. And I hope that this was um, affirming and informative. Um, and I appreciate y'all for holding me accountable as well. Uh, I know that there will be a, a longer class that goes in more in depth uh, to kind of help us unpack more of this. So I hope to see more of you there. And if there's no additional questions, I, I think that um, we can uh, end if, if y'all like. May I just add, I'm sorry, I, I need to put my video back. Thanks. Hi, folks. I'm Ken Pienfos, and I'm the um, Program uh, Development Manager for Continuing Education. It's a, a fledging new program for us, and um, I'm excited about the, the content and range of offerings that we have. I just want to point out that we're going to follow up with uh, um, an email, uh, a brief survey for you, so you can help us assess and improve um, our content and, and um, the value of continuing education programming. You'll also have Van's contact information and any other uh, follow-up and details from the session that might be worthwhile. If anyone thinks a certificate of attendance, um, it certainly doesn't present any uh, board certification or university value, but oftentimes uh, in, in work environments um, and, and on your CV, um, this kind of participation expands uh, awareness. I, I think for all communities and in all environments, please uh, reply to our follow-up email and I'll be certain that you get 
documentation from the university for, uh, for your time and for, um, again, adding this as a professional uh, exposure um, to, your, to your value. <laughs> All right. So again, we're going to communicate with you more, and I hope you will uh, reply and respond and, and um, develop and grow with us. Thanks. All right. Thanks, y'all. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Thank you, Van. Thank Great you. job. Thanks, Amelia. And then there were four. Ken, these are my